Hi and welcome to the 9.1 is the specification. If you want to read through it, um, then stop it now. There is a required practical here, which we're going to go over in the next slide. Okay, so transpiration is the evaporation of water from the leaves of a plant. And you should already know that from a previous study. The water moves up the stem of a plant in tubes called xylem. Um, the water only moves upwards, it doesn't go downwards, so make sure that you remember that. The xylem tubes are made up of stacked dead cells and the walls are strengthened by um, something called lignin. And the lignin is often drawn as a sort of spiral uh, within the xylem tubes. Okay, so required practical number seven is measuring the rate of transpiration using a uh, piece of apparatus called a potometer. Now, what you need to do in a potometer is the chute that you are investigating must be attached to the potometer. It needs to be cut under the water um, so to ensure that no air enters the xylem within this stem, because air bubbles would mean that the uh, column of water was no longer continuous and therefore transpiration um, wouldn't continue to occur. So this chute is cut under water and it's placed into the potometer. This here would be a, rub a rubber bung and it would be sealed with petroleum jelly to ensure that no air could then enter uh, the potometer. The potometer is then filled with water represented by the blue um, and an air bubble is introduced, which is here. So you have a small air bubble and the whole potometer is filled with water. As the water evaporates from the leaves or transpires from the leaves, what happens is more water is drawn up into the xylem. And as that water is drawn up into the xylem, the air bubble is going to move along the potometer. So this here is a ruler, which will allow you to determine how far the air bubble has moved. Um, uh, oh, and then this reservoir here. This reservoir holds some extra water and this is a small tap. Now, what happens when the bubble gets to the end is that you can open the tap and some of this water will move into the potometer and it will push the air bubble back to the start. So it means that you can either reset the potometer and use it again for a new shoot, or you can, um, if the air bubble gets to the end, you can push the air bubble back and then continue taking your readings um, for the same shoot. Now, what you can do with a potometer is you can change the conditions that this shoot is in. So you could add wind, you could change the temperature, you could change the humidity. Now changing humidity is quite difficult, but you will sometimes see um, investigations set up with plastic bags around the shoot, and that would then help to increase the humidity. Um, and then you could look at whether increasing the humidity increases or decreases transpiration. OK, the cohesion tension theory. So we already know that water is cohesive and that water molecules stick to each other. We know that from um, chapter two, section one. So 2.1, you do all about water. In the xylem, the cohesive properties of the water ensures that the water molecules are all stuck together and that the column of water within the xylem is continuous. I said just previously that if there's any air that enters the xylem, then the transpiration stream can't occur. And so therefore, the water won't continue to move through the plants and the plant will eventually die. Um, the water is also adhesive and that means that it sticks to the walls of the xylem. So as the um, water molecules move up and transpire out of the leaves, that then allows the water molecules to kind of jump up, remain stuck to the side of the um, xylem. And as they move up, they pull the other water molecules with them as a result of the cohesive properties. The adhesion of the water molecules in the xylem creates tension. So we don't refer to any pressure within the xylem, we only refer to tension. And the tension then allows for water to be sucked up the xylem. So it's similar to if you are sucking um, water up a straw, then tension is created, um, similar to that. And um, as the water transpires from the leaves, it continues to move up the xylem 
um, and we call that the transpiration stream. So we call kind of the movement through the plant as a result of the transpiration, the transpiration stream, but also um, the tension that's created allows the water to be pulled up and we can refer to that as the transpiration pull. So the transpiration pull causes the water to be pulled upwards. The transpiration stream is the movement of the water through the xylem from the roots all the way up to the leaves. Speaking of roots, um, the water moves into the roots via osmosis. So we should know that. So this is our root hair cell here. We've got other cells of the roots and then we've got the xylem. You can see these red rings here are representing the lignin within the xylem. And these are the soil particles with water. So the water moves in by osmosis and the mineral ions move in from the soil um, via active transport. So if they're moving via active transport, it means that there must be a low concentration in the soil and a high concentration in the root hair cell. Um, it's worth remembering as well that the mineral ions always follow the water. So the water moves in first and then the mineral ions will move in afterwards. Um, the water can move through the root cells by two pathways. So either the apoplast pathway or the symplast pathway. Now in the apoplast pathway, the water would move into the cell wall and would move through the cell walls like so. And then into the xylem. In the symplast pathway, which is shown by the arrows in this diagram, the water moves into the cells and then through the cytoplasm and into the xylem. There's also something called the Casparian strip, which would be around about here. Now the Casparian strip stops the water movement um, in the apoplast pathway. So what happens is in the apoplast pathway, the water would be moving through the cell walls. And then when it gets to the Casparian strip, it's forced into the cytoplasm into the symplast pathway, and then it moves into the xylem via the symplast pathway. So the water can't move from the cell wall into the xylem. It has to move from the cytoplasm into the xylem. And the Casparian strip is uh, responsible for diverting the water within the apoplast pathway into the cytoplasm and then to the xylem. OK, so we talked um, about minerals moving into roots just before. So the water moves into the root hair cells and minerals follow. Uh, the minerals move in by active transport, like we said. So there's a lower concentration of minerals in the soil and a higher concentration of the minerals within the cells. Um, and the min minerals are actively transported by protein pumps in the root hair cell membranes, which you should already know about from um, topic one. Uh, the last thing here is about xerophytes. So xerophytes are plants that are adapted to survive in environments with very little water. Now, these plants have lots of different adaptations in order to ensure that they can survive in the harsh environment. So they have spines instead of leaves. And the reason for this is because leaves have stomata and the stomata open and allow the water to escape. If there's spines, there's far fewer stomata, so that means that less water can leave the plant. Um, they have a thick waxy cuticle, which is the waterproof layer, so that further prevents water from being able to leave. The stomata are sunken in pits, so you can see here that the stomata are sunken in pits, which means that, um, for example, the wind can't get to the stomata, so it can't um, increase the transpiration as a re result of the wind. It also helps to increase the humidity. So the sunken stomata and these little hairs around the stomata help to trap water, um, water vapour, and it increases the humidity on the outside of the stomata. So therefore, there is a lower concentration gradient, meaning that less water will transpire. So if there's a less steep concentration gradient, then it means that less water will actually leave the stomata. Um, xerophytes also have very long roots. They're often wide rather than deep because um, if there's a lack of water, if there is any rainfall, then there'll be lots of water at the surface as opposed to deeper within the soil. So therefore, the roots are wide to be able to find more water. They often have a swollen stem, so like a cactus has a big, thick, swollen stem. Um, and leaves are often folded as well. So this here is an example of a rolled leaf. 
So if you flatten this out, if you kind of pulled this side down and this side down, it would look like a normal leaf. But this leaf has rolled itself up in order to further increase the humidity on the inside to, uh, so that there's a less steep concentration gradient and less transpiration from the stomata. We've also got here an example of the xylem vessels. So you can see that lignin on this one is drawn as rings and the lignin here is drawn kind of as a spiral. And then the second diagram is a cross section through a stem and it's showing the xylem vessels and the phloem. So you need to be able to identify the xylem vessels and the phloem within the cross section of a stem of a plant. So this is the stem, lots of xylem vessels, lots of phloem as well. We'll learn about phloem in 9.2.